Karen Elliott is an English teacher, teacher trainer and materials writer with 20 years of experience. She specializes in young and very young learners and co-authored multiple books, including activities for very young learners, along with Herbert Puchter. So welcome, Karen. And thank you, Oliver. Over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for, for joining me today. Um, I, I really hope that you get a lot out of this session and I would really love you to participate. You can ask your questions for Oliver in the chat box, but uh, in the Q&A box, but I'm actually looking at the chat box. So if you have anything to say, I would, I, I would love to, to read your comments and please do participate. So let's start with a, uh, a talk overview. And as I said, we're going to start with the chat box challenge. So please do um, add your ideas in the chat box and I'll try to read them as we go along. And then we're going to look at planning and routines. And then I thought that I would share with you some of my favorite activities for teaching very young learners, the pre-primary children. And we'll finish off with a quick look at some classroom management tips and techniques followed by your questions. So let's start. Um, the chat, the chat box challenge or quiz is I'm going to ask you to complete the sentences to make them true for you. And there are no right or wrong answers. So first of all, um, my gifts and talents are. So for example, one of my gifts is that I, uh, I can think, I can think for hours doing nothing else. So that's one of my gifts. One of my talents is being creative and drawing. So let's see, creativity. Marcia, thank you for starting off. Creativity, acting, fantastic. As you're thinking about your gifts and talents, imagine how you use them in the young learner's classroom. Rarely seen. Mm. My, I, well, Michael, I'm surprised. Um, motivation, fantastic, we need that. Doing voices, our children love it when we play and when we play with using different voices, that's a fantastic gift to bring to the classroom. Singing and creating lyrics for songs, to be able to think on your feet and think of lyrics while you're actually teaching a topic is a brilliant gift. Um, patience, energy, and curiosity, beautiful. All the things that we need to take with us to a young learner's classroom, Maria. Energy, absolutely. We need energy to match the energy of our children. Using chants for tr transitions, that's fantastic. Please do add your comments as we're going along for people to read because what a wonderful thing to do, to have a chant that you can use for transitions in the classroom that gets all the students thinking and acting together. So remember that, you can make that one of your talents as well. Okay, let's move on. The thing I remember most about being a child is, hmm, the thing I remember most about being a child was being a very highly sensitive child. So I had a lot of fears, but I also found the world to be an amazing and wonderful place. What about you? What do you remember most about being a child? A love of reading, a love for reading, fantastic. Storytelling, your mother telling you stories. Once again, these are fantastic things to take into the classroom. Playing, playing outside with friends, wonderful. I think we all remember that as one of the most important things about our child. Playing outside, joy. Another highly sensitive person. We're so, we're so important in the young learners classroom. It's, it's where we can shine. Performing plays, yes, all the things that children like to do, riding a bike, being outside, playing with sand in the classroom. Kiat Ao Young, 
Well, I hope you can play with sand with your children too, because you will go back when we think of the things that we did as children that we love to do. When we do them with our young learners, we are playing again. And when we play with our children, we bring them so much joy and we share something together. Climbing trees, yes, reading. Okay, let's move on. What I liked best about my first years at school was, what I liked best were, I liked best uh, making things, singing songs, and my kind teachers who I remember to this day. As a student, yes, what did you like? And that's a very good question. Discovering things, learning new things, absolutely. When we actually give our children an experience that is something new, you can see it in their eyes, their eyes start to shine. They get very excited when, you, when a child can suddenly realize that they can read um, short words or whatever, or when they see something they've never seen before, you can see it in their eyes. And we're always looking for this everything you liked your oh that's wonderful Daniela my teacher's smiling Devorka lovely lovely touching different textures and materials Daia I hope you can do that with your students as well it's a fantastic activity singing and acting in public lots of different things okay remember the things that you liked best that doesn't mean that every child likes the same things but what it does mean is that you are going back again to a moment in time when you go into your classroom. When you think like a child, you are able to help the children. And we all know how exciting it is to learn to read or to have somebody approve of what we've done. Or when our teacher smiles, even we have to, we have to remember to do these things when we're in the classroom. Let's move on to the last question. Okay. What children most need is, what do children most need? A big playground, I would agree. Love, absolutely. Affection, to be seen. That's close to my answer. I think that children um, most need is to be appreciated for who they are. They need love and care. And this is kind of a moving, um, uh, what would you say? We have to remember that the truth is not a truth forever. Perhaps 30 years ago, a teacher would think that what a child most needed was discipline, maybe, or um, guidance. And then we don't know in another 10 or 20 years time what the answer to this question would be because human beings are always evolving. So we need to always be open. What children most need is what they need at that moment when you are actually in relationship with them and helping them. So um, moving on from here now, I don't know if you are familiar with Eric er Erickson's theory of psychosocial development, but he talks about the needs of people as they evolve, as they go, as they become older. And the very first thing from not to 18 years is where we learn to trust or to feel mistrust. Then we move into a stage of autonomy versus shame and doubt. Moving on to being able to move out into the world, to have initiative, to move, to explore versus guilt. And moving on to actually creating things, to being industrious, to, to, fit, to a feeling of inferiority. These are the, the possibilities. And I would say that all of us have suffered in some ways um, because of just the, the nature of being a human being, that our upbringings weren't perfect that all of these things are, we're somewhere in the middle. But what we need to do as a teacher is we need to think about how these um, different issues affect the children that we're teaching and how each of them come with their own experience to our classroom. So I would say in the pre-primary classroom, a child needs to be able to say, I can trust and feel safe. Please keep writing in the chat box if you have any ideas. 
And I also think that we need to be aiming for a child to say, it's okay to be me exactly as I am. It's okay to move and act. And I can contribute with my gifts and talents, which takes us back to that first question. Now, we take our gifts and talents into the classroom and our students also um, bring their gifts and talents. And what I think is quite important is that our gifts and talents are not for other people. Our gifts and talents are the tools for our life. And we may be um, a fantastic painter or tennis player or whatever. That may be something that other people see. But another gift that we may have may be in understanding when a friend of ours is sad or in simply looking after ourselves. And these gifts and talents are tools that we take with us in our life that are equally as important. And as such, we should be celebrating our children's gifts and talents uh, without comparing. We're always looking at ways to help them to feel, and I think I have my question here, to help them to feel that they are a whole and complete human being just the way they are. So this is, this is why we need to go into the classroom with the sense of creating this environment. And uh, I think this is also the work, the work of every teacher is that in order to be able to do these things well, and I'm still working on this myself, we actually need to feel these things ourselves. We need to develop a mindset in this world of trust and feeling safe. We need to develop the mindset that it's okay to be who we are, to do what we do, and to contribute with our gifts and talents to make our lives whole and meaningful. So in the classroom, we have um, starting the class, starts before we actually start the class, as I'm sure you all know. So in the planning phase, we need to think about what we're going to actually, um, what we're going to do in each class. And the best way, I think, is to have a series of classes with an overarching theme as a way to Look for the stories that you need, look for the songs that you need, the videos, the plays, the uh, craft activities that you're going to do so that you can start to collect a body based around a particular theme or topic. So, for example, a very good one, of course, is the seasons, which allows um, us to then start to explore a whole set of things to do with the weather, with clothes, um, the stories that go with the different kinds of seasons and so on. So to start um, a successful series of classes, I think you need a, a topic or theme, not necessarily for a term, but for several classes. And you need to um, plan your lesson. Um, I think it's, it's um, so important, especially for the young ones. And the reason being, we have so many activities. Your plan could just be a list of the activities that you're going to do. But of course, you will need to know which materials and have them ready. Because if you're going to start a craft activity and suddenly realize that the scissors or the crayons are in another room or whatever, you are going to lose the momentum of the class and, and then it will be hard to get it back. And the other thing that I would suggest at the beginning of every class on your lesson plan is to write a question for yourself about the class that you're about to teach. It could be to think about your pacing. It could be to think about a particular group of children. It could be a question like, it could be something as simple as like, mm, will, I, uh, will my role play work with this group of students? So that you are actually thinking about uh, what you're going to, to do in terms of a question, not necessarily in terms of a list of things that you're going to do. 
And then moving on from here, I would recommend that you start each class with a routine. First of all, this gathers the group together and it, uh, it allows you to, um, what, what can I say? It allows you to create that safety in a very simple way. So the children know basically what's going to happen to start and they also know that it's an English class and you're going to revise some language which will help them. And um, so obviously you would start with a who's here. And then an idea that I like is having a group identity. For example, my class are often stars. We're all stars, that's fantastic. But also um, I, did, I did have some busy bees for a couple of years. We are busy bees. And um, this allows us to have a little chant or something, which brings all the class together. So as was, we are busy, busy bees, busy, busy bees, buzz, 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 zzz, like that. So it was a very, very simple thing to do, but uh, it allows to, it creates a group identity, which is quite helpful for bringing the class together and for helping everybody to feel safe and uh, part of a group. Then of course, there's always the birthdays you'd need to check through and see. And, and I don't like to spend a great deal of time on the birthdays, but I do have a, a little uh, crown that they can wear and they blow out, make a wish or, and blow out a candle on a cake. And, and then I really, I actually take the crown away and we move on with the class because otherwise, <laughs> anyway, I'm sure you all have your own birthday routine, but uh, it's like a way of creating um, a, a, a time for everyone to be special. But I have another one, which is that every, every class we have a different star. So I would have my star, and a little bag full of names. And I write, I, I pick the name out of the, out of the bag. Claudia is today's star, hooray. So it means that Claudia is special today. That's all. Maybe we're all going to cheer and clap. Maybe she's going to go first in the line. Maybe she's going to be the main character. Maybe she's going to help me. I don't know, but I have a star for the day. And obviously you need to have them all in a bag and put them in a different bag. So everybody gets a chance to be a star, but it's quite nice that it's, uh, it's a surprise. Okay. And some more, act I, I should mention here that the routines, these first routines for the class, actually all of this shouldn't take too long. You don't want to lose the momentum. It's just a way to bring everybody together. Who's here? A group chant, uh, uh, who's special today, and so on. And then we want a few like little revision activities, for example, to repeat a fun song, chant, or drill that you know that the children like from lessons that you've done before, a little animal song, or a. Um, and then I have a little flashcard game if we need to revise some language. For example, here, imagine if you were doing food. And then I could go through the flashcards. Here we have apple sandwich, biscuit, apple juice. And then I will turn the card away and I will take one off. Hmm, let me see which one. And then I can go back and say, what's missing? Hands up, hands up. Okay, John, tell me what do you think is missing? And actually the kids are really good at this and you can have um, more than six cards. I usually have about 10 to 12 and it's a way to get everybody speaking English and to opening their minds. Um, and then if I do that for revising and warm up, I might actually play the guessing bag game for moving on to the topic or the story of the day. For example, I have my bag here and I will say this is not a brother it's not a brother it's the oh starts with oh we have a sister here okay what else have I got in here something yum yum to eat it's a uh, sweet and I think I've got something here it's 
got eight legs and it makes a web. What do you think it could be? And yes, it's a spider because today we're doing the letter sounds and then we can work on it from there. So once again, guessing games, opening the children's minds, play, work. It's all the same when we're little and probably when we're older, it should be as well. Okay, so let's move on to my favorite activities. And um, I'm going to start straight away with stories because I think stories form a huge part of what we what we do with our children and they pave the way for not only our imagination but also they give us a tool another tool for living and one of them is that in a story almost always a problem is presented and feelings are explored both of these are things that we all face in our lives and we have to learn to, um, to work with and to work, make work for us. And they could be feelings normally in a story at the beginning, if there's a problem, fear, anger, sadness may be involved. Now, normally the main character solves the problem and these are the stories that we like the best, I think, because we identify with the main character and, um, and then transformation occurs. Through this, uh, this th I think this is why human beings and stories just go together. There's, there's no difference. We are a story. We tell stories because there are ways that we make sense of the world and to, to learn to solve problems. So we're going to have a look. I think you may have, if, you, if you've been um, watching this series, you've already done this story. We're not going to go through this story, but it's a great story for explaining the concepts that I was just talking about. And so the first thing I would do is show a picture from the book of the, of the problem, for example, and ask some questions. Our questions have to be quite easy for the age group. They Obviously, their intellect and, and what they're thinking is much higher than the level of language they can produce in English. And so who's this? Well, it's a duck. Is she happy? No, no, she's sad. Why is she sad? So already we're opening up the children's minds to think about the problem. So I'm sure you have some ideas. Hmm? I'm sure you have some ideas. Why is she sad? Let's find out. Okay, so while we're telling this story, we can see that our main character is going around trying to solve the problem. And, and she says, will you play with me? We can ask our students to repeat, will you play with me? Hmm? But I'm sorry, but fish is too busy. No. So then duck sees frog. Will you play with me? We can ask our students to repeat. And finally, through Duck's persistence, Duck finds someone to play with and they're both happy. And there we have our transformation from a sad and lonely Duck to one who has a friend. So after the story, we can check with no, yes, no questions. Here we have Frog. We say, can Frog play? No. Can Goose play? Yes. Goose and Duck are friends. If you do a role play, I, I, um, you can keep it super simple. Just try to find the main thing in the story and then you can have one of your children. I like to use these little headbands. I don't know if you know them from Tiger. Okay, each one can be a different animal. You don't have to stick to the, the, to the story. And, and someone is a duck and duck goes around asking, will you play with me? And then they say no. And you can tell which, which of the uh, students is going to say yes. Even duck doesn't have to know. But just think about the story and you can do this sort of thing in small groups or bigger groups. And obviously you don't need the headband. It's just, I'm always looking for ways to make it more like fun. And students like a bit of craziness, a bit of absurdity. 
And the headbands are quite useful for other guessing games as well. Then you can think about the, stong, the songs. For example, we've got the five little ducks went swimming one day. We've got five speckled frogs. You can, and then move on to craft activities. For example, you can get a plate and make a pond um, and things like that. There's so many different craft activities, activities, but activities, but try, but try to the, the class on. And so you've got your routines at the beginning and then you want things to get a little bit surprising. At the beginning, you were saying how you love discovering new things. And that's what students remember uh, is, is the kinds of surprises that came, came about in a class. Um, something super easy that you can do that I really, really enjoy doing. And I actually have these uh, big, um, a foam dice and I also have a um, box for each group or if I'm doing it with the class we use one box and the students have to throw the dice into the box but maybe that says something more about me and if you don't mind dice flying all over the room that's fine but um, you can play this game in so many ways you just have to choose six items that you're teaching the students and uh, on the board, you draw a picture with a number next to each one. And in groups, the children roll the, roll the dice. They take turns and they have a pond in this case. And then they have to draw or you can cut out little pictures and they can glue the pictures in as they um, get the numbers. And uh, this, this allows you to go around the room and asking them, What's number one? That's right, it's a duck. And oh, you have, did you, you've got number five. What is it? So you can actually um, develop their language while they're all having fun and playing a game. Moving on with the dice game, you can do it at older levels where they get to choose between two, two different items. And uh, one of my favorite ones is food because um, talking about whether you like food or not is something we all love to do. And uh, so in this case, the children get to choose their lunch. When they roll uh, a five, they choose between cheese and an egg. And so that, that gives them the chance to also um, make something different. Each child ends up with a, a different lunch. Um, and these dice games are really fun and you can use them with I've, I've also got a set for like uh, building your own toy box uh, you know if you look at what what you've got as long as there are six to twelve vocabulary items based around a theme another one that I love is the face game where one is the eye and then they have to roll two ones to get the two eyes and a nose and mouth ears hair and the neck and that gives you your six parts so moving on, another one of my very favorite activities is my mini whiteboard, because you can use this for all kinds of things from as simple as saying, um, everybody, let's draw an apple, okay, and everybody draws an apple and everybody's apple will look different and then everybody shows each other their apple. And then you rub it off and you get a chance to do it better if you didn't like it. So we're learning how to practice without getting too like uh, worried about what we're doing, which was always one of my problems. So I'm probably a little bit like um, overly aware that some of the students find, some children find it much harder because they want to be perfect. Uh, another thing I like to use it for is to teach children how to draw. So the tiny little ones, when we do classroom language, adore, adore, one, two, three. And then look at that, I've got a door. And I can do all the classroom language, all the different things in the classroom, the table, the chair, the pencil case, the pen. And as you go, the, the window is an easy one and so on. So you can actually do directed drawing activities and teach children how to draw. Then I like to use them also when we're watching phonics videos or whatever, and, I'll, and they all sit there and they, they draw the letters when they see the letters. And so they're actually doing something while they're, they're watching or we do it together. 
and moving right on until they're learning how to write, uh, for example, their CVC words, their first short vowel sound words. And so they're learning to practice, going from learning how to draw to learning how to read and write. And also you can use them, of course, for maths activities and everything like that. And just to have a, a whole set of little mini whiteboards in the classroom, I'm sure many of you use them. So, but it is one of my favorite activities. So moving on from there, of course, there's bingo, famous bingo. I have this all set up um, and I would recommend that as well. So I have all my little bingo squares, um, my bingo mats, sorry. And then I have the little bingo squares all ready to go. So all the kids have to do, for example, if this was colors, they would choose the colors. If this is numbers, they would choose and write the numbers. If this is um, letter sounds, they can choose the letter sounds from the, the list that I have on the board going right up to um, CVC words. And so you can just have a bag. And then of course your star for the day gets to hand out all the little squares, six for each person and counting them out as they go. So I think, especially with little children, we should recognize that the activity starts well before the activity. It starts by you being prepared, by you having the material, and then by the whole process of giving out all the pieces or whatever you're doing. And um, as you can see with bingo, of course, you can put your uh, little squares on like this. And then we can, when someone's won, you just take them all off and you can start again. And uh, moving on to the next activity, this is another thing that I like is doing what I call mini, like half page treasure hunts. Um, and here we're going to watch a video. I don't usually like watching videos unless I have the children doing something. If they have little flashcards that they're pointing to or um, whatever. And this is a really fun way to get children watching a, a, a video and looking for something. So in this case, as you, as you know, with very young learners, lots of activities where they tick the boxes, tick or cross or whatever is really helpful as well because um, if you ask them to write, it takes a long time and some children take longer than as, others as well. So um, I'm going to show you this example using a video. So imagine you have these squares in front of you and I would go through it first and say, so what's this? That's right, it's an apple. Who wants to tell me what the next fruit is? Yes, Sonia, it's a banana and so on. We would go through them all and I would say, now listen, and it may be that I give out the pencils now. Yes, just before. Okay, let's listen and watch. I want you to look and see all of these things and see which ones you can remember. This is a little quiz for you. Okay, so we're going to watch the video now. that you can ask questions and get the children speaking as they watch Okay, so then we look at our sheets and I can say, what did you see? Did you see an apple and some? Yes, yes, I saw four apples. I put four ticks, teacher, and so on, and two bananas, here we go. Did you see an orange? 
No, no oranges. There was an onion. I know it looked like an orange, but it was an onion. Did you see a sandwich? And so on. So then we could go through the whole thing. And as the children, uh, you'll find naturally they start to say things like, um, I saw an apple, a banana and a sandwich, for example. So you start to, you start to um, develop students' abilities uh, to speak in longer sentences by doing these kinds of activities. So as far as songs and chants go, we all know how important they are. And um, here we have a food chant. And once again, you can use uh, your flashcards, of course. You can ask the children to hold up the flashcards when they hear the words in a song. You can ask them to mime, to pretend to eat, for example. What does it look like? To peel a banana or eat an apple? You can get them to rub their tummies if they like something, or Ugh, if they don't. So um, using to what we call total physical response, of course, during songs, get them to dance. You can get them to do theater to the songs using the headbands. You could have the people who are the bananas and the people who are the apples. You can ask them questions. And if the song is popular, you can use it as part of the class routine. We'll just quickly listen to this song because it's very short and um, you can tell me whether you would use it or not, because actually it's a very sweet song. So. Book, unit 5, page 56. Listen to the song. Let's sing! Yum! Yum! So I think a song like this is a, a calming song and it can work quite well either at the end of a class or it can, because it's short also, it can work really well as part of the, the start routine for a few, a few classes or a week or, or whatever. And remember to have a mixture of bouncy, bouncy, happy songs and quiet songs for your students because it's amazing how many of them really do like the the sweet and quiet songs as well so we get into this idea that everybody's got to be so modern or whatever but I think you'll find that um, everybody likes variety and um, you can play around with songs like this uh, a lot as well so the other time that I use the what can you see activities are to uh, look around the classroom for different things. You can look for shapes or you can go outside in the playground and especially now with spring coming up, this is one activity that I um, use at springtime. 
to get the kids out in the playground looking for bugs and spiders. You would be surprised how many spiders hang up under the, um, the eaves um, in the covered part of the playground. And they're usually ants as well. So um, it's like heaps of fun. And another thing you can do is send it home for your students to do with their parents. So just to show you the different ways that you can do kind of treasure hunt activities. Mm, and of course, um, it's really important that we do uh, not everything on paper as well. And kids love science activities. And this is a super simple one where you just get three bottles of colored water. You have to set it up really carefully. They have their little glasses and you ask in their groups, what color do you want to make first? And you've worked out, you've established that blue and yellow makes green. And so um, to let them do it, even to let them make mistakes and all of these things, they, they find this very exciting. You can also use vinegar and bicarb of soda to make fizzy things and fizzy things with colors. All of these things in the classroom, I highly recommend because the kids get really excited, but they're learning so much about how colors are made and um, and other things to do with life which are very important and which don't involve coloring in or other kinds of things that we can rely on too heavily and which I don't, do not interest all of the students. Um, it's always, now that we're on the topic of spring, of course, I would always add a planting session. If your classroom is big enough, you can plant seeds and watch them grow. If it's small, you can plant little plants that they get to take home um so that's another really fun activity it's so important that we teach our children how living things grow and another thing that i love to have in my classroom i have a bag full of shapes colored shapes and um they're fantastic because you can ask students, of course, they can make uh, a town, animals, transport, uh, make sure you have lots of circles if you do transport. And uh, I'll show you a, a town here. We had a, a town going on, lots and lots of little circles, stickers and things. Um, and here, shapes, I love shapes. I mean, and I have got a song that you can use. It's, it's actually um a tune that we all know and it goes like this can you see a circle a circle a circle can you see a circle now point to one please can you see a triangle a triangle a triangle can you see a triangle now point to one please but remember the tune because you can use it for all kinds of things, pencil case or pen or whatever you're doing. So it's just a great song to keep in your mind if you're looking for a, a, a TPR activity where everyone's busy um, looking for things around the classroom or in the playground or whatever. Um, what I love about doing this with shapes in the classroom is it is amazing how many shapes there are and all the different shapes, the rectangles, the stars, and so on in the classroom and how children will find shapes that you never saw. So it, it, it gives you, um, it, it makes you excited as well. And so I'm going to finish this section talking about this shapes activity that I do, did with my students. And one of the children just suddenly went for yellow and then yellow and then yellow and he never stopped using yellow and he was so excited and at the time I was like that's not what I would do and I I want to tell you it was like it was like he wasn't playing by my rules this is something we have to be very careful about that sometimes we want the students to play by our rules and they're not, and we can get upset or we can feel something which is not, it's, it's, it's got nothing to do with us. There's some reason that this child decided that his whole house was going to be yellow and it's absolutely beautiful. And at the time it, 
it made me feel uneasy for some reason. So I would recommend that we don't always even um, like that sometimes we just hold back. And do you remember when I talked about having that question on your lesson plan? I would recommend also writing something at the end of your class. And in this class, I would have written, um, Simon's house is all yellow. And I would allow that to sink in. And um, so I just think that sometimes we have to check ourselves as well. And that brings me on to the last part, which is um, classroom management. And just a few tips and tricks. I'm sure we all have our own. And um, one that I use a lot is to get people's attention, a quick um, rhyme, hands on heads, hands on knees, cross your arms and listen, please. Hands on heads, hands on knees, cross your arms and listen, please. And I can do it indifferent, I can do it loud, I can do it soft, I can whisper it, I can sing it, and the children uh, following along with me, and then I stop. I don't wait for every single child because we have to remember what is our objective and it's to move on to the next activity. So when we have our attention grab grabbers, remember our objective is that everybody is looking at us, not necessarily doing what we want them to do. We have to be careful of stepping the line between our objectives are to move on to the next activity and a feeling of domination. And I've had to go through this myself of not really recognizing when I was just trying to lay down the law, so to speak. So always focus on your objectives. We have the Everybody maybe knows this one already. Hands up, hand when I put my hand up, or when another child is decided it's too noisy, put their puts their hands up, hands up, and look at me, look at the teacher. And what is your objective to get everybody looking at you so you can move on to the next activity? Um, focus on the good behavior that you see. So, oh, Sarah's looking at me. Thank you, Sarah. And everyone looks at Sarah to find out what it is she's doing. Oh, look. Uh, uh, what you've written that word really well, and let's all have a look at this at this word or or whatever. So if we focus on the good behaviour, um, everybody knows what we want, and we're keeping a positive attitude, and we're also not focusing on the students who are not doing what we um, who are not doing what we want them to do, which can take away from the uh, from from focusing on what we want to be doing. And sometimes I find that if I speak quietly or whisper, you can you try this, try this, and the next time you go in the classroom, it gets a bit loud, start whispering. And you may find that at some point, everybody's whispering. And um, that's really quite nice as well when that happens. Okay, and uh, the last activity, catch them being good so um you may have these are the star chart on uh on the left is something that i have done many times where i have um all everybody's name on a star and then they when i see someone doing something good their name goes up and we're all hoping to get onto the rainbow and if we all get onto the rainbow then there's a little surprise actually i don't think i ever got everybody onto the rainbow but I got a lot of good things done in a class. And, um, and also, of course, you always start every single class with everybody in the same place. So it's every class starts fresh again. And the other activity, the marble jar, I've never done this, but I thought I would um, share it with you because a friend of mine shared it with me and um, she puts marbles in a jar uh, every time the class does something good and then the idea is when the jar fills up they they get a special treat they get to listen I don't know to their favorite song or they get a sticker or whatever but um, if there's some bad behavior for example maybe some some kids being mean to another kid you know instead of actually like um, separating anyone out or getting angry 
She'll just take some jars, uh, some marbles out of the jar and say, oh, I saw some girls being not very nice today. They, mm, I think they have to apologize or I'm, you know, and so I'm going to put these marbles back um, in the other jar for now and let's see how you go. So just some ideas. And there will always be challenging students and sometimes the children, um, we just have to love the most challenging students even more, but never forget that you can involve the parents and man managers. You're not in this alone. You are just there in the classroom being hopefully um, an inspiration and learning from your children and giving them what they need, but you're not alone. There's a world out there of people who will help you if you ask. And that's it. So thank you very much. I think it's time for some questions. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Many thanks to you, Karen, for such an interesting and practical um, session. Um, if you if just, if you've liked the material shown by Karen, used by Karen here today, you can see more at cambridge.org slash Pippa and Pop. Um, if there are further questions that the audience want to put to Karen, um, please put them in the, um, the Q&A box. Um, we won't have very many minutes to, to, to deal with them, but we've got one in the meantime, which is how can I do craft activities successfully with, with very young learners? Okay, so um, the first thing I would say is obviously keep it simple and think about how you would do the activity if you were a small child. That's the first place to start. And then of course that depends. I'll use the example I think of a snowman because we've got our three circles maybe. Maybe they're going to have to then stick a, a hat on the snowman and a scarf or whatever. So imagine a three-year-old trying to do this activity. Would you give them scissors and ask them to cut out the circles? No. So what you would have to do is you would have your small circles and your medium circles and your big circles all ready to go. But this um, allows for like a, an opportunity because then they can come and say, can I have a small circle, please? Can I have a medium circle, please? Can I have a big circle? And so the next thing to do is don't give out the glue until they're ready to glue. So think about it step by step. So you would have each of your pieces out. And, um, and so give out the materials as they need them, not before. And make sure that whatever you do um, is age appropriate in terms of what you need to have ready for them. Uh, before they can start the activity and then think about the language because if they have to come and ask you for things that's always really helpful as well so then obviously when the kids get older they can cut out but it will take them a long time if they're five or six they can probably cut out the circles and it's very beautiful because they'll all be different some students will make tiny snowmen others will make giant ones and some will make triangles and so um, I think what we need to do at this point is celebrate the creativity and look for the way um, the students use their own individuality in their craft work. Okay um, there were a couple more one, one, one of them is uh, going back to the song you sang and, mm. and someone was asking which, what What's the tune? Ah, I think it's that. Can you see a lassie, a lassie, a lassie? Do you know that tune? Um, yeah. So it's da di da di da di di da di di da di di da di da di da di di da di di da. Yeah. So it's super easy. I mean, you you might think of your own. I remember somebody saying that they. Uh, that they love to make their own chants and things. So you can you can use anyone. The, the reason I like that one is it's so easy to remember. So if suddenly I have five minutes at the end of the classroom, I can get everybody pointing at things around the room or whatever. Um, 
so so yes i don't know i think i saw that comment about the witch song it could be the witch song i have a feeling it's one of those tunes that like goes with lots of different um, traditional songs yeah did you ever see a lassie yes there it is <laughs> Excellent. And then there's just a very final question because we, we really must wrap up. It's been a wonderful session, a wonderful hour. Um, I'd like to know if there's a, if there's special material for teaching kids online. Thanks a million. You made, you made it in a flawless way. Um, and it's probably worth just pointing out that Pippa and Pop does come with um, online support for students around, um, you know, uh, audio and, and, and video to help them. But if there's anything else, Karen, you'd like to add there? Oh, there, it's, there's so many things online. Um, if you just look at uh, songs for young learners, uh, I mean, it's just wonderful. And you'll find so many different things. You do need to go through them and you need to listen to them first, but um, I don't even know where to start. <laughs> but uh, there is loads of stuff online for young learners. The main thing I like to say about that is don't just ask them to watch it. Do something with it. Yeah. Turn it into something, uh, a total physical response, a theater or uh, put a hand out with it because we don't want our kids just sitting there passively taking in the information if possible. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Well, so thank you so much to all of you for, for attending and thank you so much for um for to karen um who's done a wonderful presentation um it, this is the last of our series of pre-primary um, events and we hope you've enjoyed them and can join us for more sessions in the future and don't forget to look out for an email next week with a survey certificate and the links to all the recordings but most of all thank you to all of you and thanks to Karen for this. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank you Oliver. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.